Good morning. We'll get situated here. Yeah, I've heard uh, many stories throughout uh, Kim's childhood growing up in this church, and so she has many fond memories, and I myself have had nothing but pleasant experience since I've met you all uh, since 2012-ish, I think. And so, yeah, we were most recently, we were serving in Kenya for a couple of years. Our youngest one was born, and she's had medical complications, and uh, that brought us back home to our sending organization, which is based out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. I was with you last summer, and I feel like that was the first time we started getting our feet underneath us for the first time, and really since 2018, um, we're going through such hectic times for us. And so uh, this past year has been amazing and ministry-wise, where uh, we have t- Tuesday night Bible studies, about 45 people over there in Fayetteville, Arkansas now, and uh, at the University of Arkansas, they got this pig suey chant. Um, it's not for me, but you know, it's just a school, right? But there's groups of people going through uh, deeper topics, uh, able to do that. There's five people that I've had a lot of contact with that are now in the country of Georgia doing missionary training, hoping to go to unreached people groups. So God's just doing neat things. Um, we have, uh, I, I've even been in touch for my time in Kenya with a missionary or with a guy who's a missionary over on the coast close to Somalia. And uh, he's reaching out to Muslims, has recently seen a couple Muslims come uh, to know the Lord Jesus and um, are trying to get plugged into a healthy church over there. And so I wanted to give you just a quick update on all that, just to say uh, thank you for your investments. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you uh, for your time. And it was a joy for the men who was able to gather this weekend. Uh, It was a joy and a privilege. And so... um, I want to start off just praying as we dive in. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to share with you from uh, Proverbs 4 this morning, but before I do, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Father, we love you, and we thank you for uh, um, just allowing us to gather, Father. Thank you for your word and revealing yourself through that. And just as the flower withers and the grass fades, your word, however, stands forever. Would we hear from it? Would we surrender to it? Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I wonder, have you, what what have you been affected by? What have you been affected by? One of the biggest things that affects us and why we love as a culture so much are movies, right? We go and we're able to see with our eyes and hear with our ears. And and if it's an extremely good movie, it may even compel us to action. I remember that as a young teenage boy watching Braveheart for the first time. Let's go fight for freedom, right? Uh, painting my face blue, I probably did that a few times as well. People affect us, don't they? Whether positive or negative. Maybe we had a good father, and you're able to watch how he worked hard, and with his speech, how he was winsome. And it affected you in the way you are. Or maybe you had the reverse effect and you didn't have that in your life. But we're affected by things that we see and things that we hear. And so God set up our bodies that way strategically. And we're going to see that in Proverbs 4. If you don't happen to have a Bible, or I know you have it on your phone, but if you do just want to grab the pew, it's on page 488. Now if you follow with me in Proverbs 4, uh, verses 20 through 27. Give you a second to turn there. Proverbs 4, 20 through 27 reads as follows. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the spring of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left or turn your foot away from evil. So King Solomon wrote this, and in this part, he's talking about a father addressing the son. And in Proverbs 4, this is the sixth or the seventh speech that a father is giving his son. 
And there are three subsets to this chapter. And so the chapter is first, it's, it's a, called, a call to apprenticeship. He calls his son to apprenticeship and to get wisdom and to walk wisely. He calls to remember and to obey. And that's what falls underneath uh, our section today. It's going to be in verses 20 through 27. He calls him to remember and to obey wisdom. And then lastly in that chapter is going to be uh, verses 28 to the end of the chapter. And that's where he warns them from illicit sexual relationships. I always like to give context because it's always important to know what's kind of going on around a Bible verse before we just jump in. I was telling the guys this weekend, the Bible can never mean what it never meant. So we want to do our due diligence and try to understand what was the original tent of the author, and then we can apply it to us today. So a summary statement may be this. It's a devotion to wisdom that encompasses the entire body. Sorry, these are just summary statements of this. In chapter 4, it will move from history through the home and out into life before ending with a call of wholehearted commitment to living by God's wisdoms, not our own. It's a picture of fully embodied devotion to wisdom. So the main idea that we're going to get at today is simply this. Guard your heart. That's it. But there's going to be three sections here that we're going to see that Solomon puts it in. And verses 20 through 22 is going to simply say, messages affect your heart. Verse 22 is going to be, kind of, or, sorry, verse 23 is going to be kind of the crux of it all, the center of it all, is that your heart is the command center of your life. And then we'll conclude with this, that your behavior, it's going to reveal the condition of your heart. So let's start with the first point here. Messages affect your heart. Verses, look with me in verse 20. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my saying. Or another way to say it is listen closely. Come close and listen to my saying. So his words here, the father, are his, his words are wisdom. What is wisdom? Well, wisdom is a return to Eden. Wisdom is a return to paradise. It, it reverses the curse's effect upon our life. Where, then, can we find this wisdom? Well, it starts, the whole Proverbs 1, it starts this very way in Proverbs 1, 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And fools, they despise wisdom, so fools despise God and instruction. Notice with me that in verse 20, we need to watch what we listen to. It says what? To incline your ear. Now, I'm going to expound a bit on this more, but just keep that in the back of your mind as we move down to verse 21. Verse 21 says, let them, and that's the then there is his words and his wisdom. Let them not escape from your sight, but rather keep them in your heart. And just a comment about the heart and way we understand. And in our heart, we always say to follow your heart. And usually what we mean by that are our emotions. How, what is your emotions? How do you feel? And follow that. Not at all what the Bible means. There is a part to that. But let me read it. Wisdom's view in human nature, or sorry, wisdom's view in Bible of human nature, it sees the heart as the physical, the intellectual, the spiritual, and the emotional center. So the mentality of the Bible is that we think, feel, love, and worship with our hearts. And the Bible actually will place the mind as the subject of the heart. You can't divorce the two like we so often like to do. The mind is very much a part. Where the heart goes, the Bible says the thinking will go with it. So also notice that it says, wisdom can escape you, so keep it in your heart. And how do we not allow wisdom to escape us? Well, look with me at uh, Psalm 119. You don't have to turn there, but Psalm 119, verse 11, uh, it says this, that I have stored up your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Think about Jesus. How does Jesus fight Satan in the desert? He quotes Scripture. Things like, I do this. I, but it, it says this, actually. You've misunderstood Scripture, Satan. 
So how do you today store up God's word in your heart? I wonder. Think about Romans 12 that it says that the, uh, therefore there is, um, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because when you do that, then you'll be able to test what God's will is. How do you, you want to know God's will? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? You find wisdom. Where's wisdom found? In God, in the scriptures that he's given us. Do you see? And so be transformed, and then you'll know what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. So again, notice the ears in verse 20. And in verse 21, it talks about the eyes. And the Bible has in mind that these are the gateway to our heart. So what messages are we listening to? What messages do you believe this morning? Are they messages from the Bible? Are they messages from the word, wor- the world? And if it is our eyes, what are we, what are we watching? What are we allowing to see with our eyes in our entertainment culture today? What impacts your heart the most? If it's scripture, praise God. If it's something else, let us confess and repent. Verse 22 says this. Again, so he says, for they, he's talking about the man's wisdom and his words, the father's, right? His, his words, his His wisdom are life to those who find them and their healing to all of their flesh. Wisdom is the process of receiving the right words and listening to the right voices. Now, what do we have in mind when it says life? That you're going to find life. Well, Jesus says this in John 10, 10. The thief, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy but I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. God commands and wisdoms, his commands and his wisdoms are to bless us. Do you believe that this morning? They're not here to curse you. His commands, the the Lord is not some sort of cosmic killjoy. He's not out to steal your happiness or your well-being. Look with me in verse 22. He's here to give you life. And and Jesus says, I want to give it to the full. So rather, his words are intended to bring us the fullness of life. I wonder, do you want fullness of life this morning? Will you obey Christ's words or will you obey your own words? His rule and his reign in your life, along with your obedience to him, that is the greatest life the Bible says that you can have. Life is most fully hit or lived fully. Life is most lived fully when it is hitched to the wisdom of God. And you know, the disciples, they recognized this, didn't they? When Jesus was like, Are you going to leave me? And what do they say in John 6 68? He says, Where else shall we go, Lord? Where else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Why would I depart and do anything else? I will follow you. And what is he meaning here about health to your body? Well, it's just a way of saying that you're going to live as you ought. You're going to live as you ought. Now, is that a promise? Blanket statement? Is it a guarantee? It's not, is it? We're in a fallen world. But wisdom will lead you towards that path. But reading, what we got to do is like, oh, well, that didn't happen for me. This is where it's helpful to read all of the wisdom literature together. So the Bible's broken up in different sections, but one of the sections is the wisdom literature, and you got um, Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. So if we're just going to take Job, or, uh, Proverbs, it could be a little tricky, but God's also given us Job. What happened to Job? He was a righteous man, and he was doing everything right, and then what happened? It's all taken away from him. But what did he do? At first, anyway, blessed be the name of the Lord. So we know not all goes well with those who are righteous, And then we get the other extreme of Ecclesiastes. All is going well. He's living it perfectly, but it's hevel. It's the Greek word, which is just smoke. The chasing after the wind, if that's all you're going to live for apart from God's wisdom. That's what's going on in Ecclesiastes. It doesn't say that it's not great. It's just if you're going to live for it, it's nothing but hevel or smoke. But so in here in Proverbs, we got to hold that. And so it's not going to happen 
but it's a it's going to lead that way anyway. So whose voices and messages do you listen to? What are the different voices that we consume throughout the week? What voices do our culture tell us that we should listen to? What do we have to fight against? Things like the big hot topics today, gender. (laughs) What is a man and a woman? Marriage, what is a marriage? Do I have to get married? What's the point of that? Who is God and who can define God? Only God, by the way, can define God. What we often like to do is define him. And Thomas Aquinas once said this, that only God knows the depths and the riches of the Godhead. And divine wisdom alone can declare his secrets. Only God can be allowed to define God. And he's revealed that through himself in creation. And he's also revealed himself through his written word and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. What about church? Gathering. Gathering is just optional, isn't it? Well, not if we open up scriptures. It doesn't seem to leave it optional at all. Hebrews 10, 24 would tell us otherwise. Are we taking Scripture and letting it define our lives? Do you take Scripture and let it define our lives? Or are we going to define our lives and fit it into Scripture where it's convenient? So I think that's how we want to think about that. The next section, let's move on to point number two here, and that's going to be found just in verse 23, that your heart, it's the command center for your life. Verse 23 reads as follows. He says, keep your heart with diligence or above all else. Above all else, keep your heart. For from it flows the springs of life. Or I like to think of it, for from it flows the source of life. The key verse to actually understanding all of the Proverbs and of life. Keep, it means more than just obey. It means to guard, to maintain with diligence, to be watchful. Think about a wall in the Old Testament times, if you're familiar at all, there's, or in old times, they would build walls around a city, right? To keep people out, to guard, to protect the people, to give life to the people. And so you'd have watchmen, be watchful, watching for any kind of evil. That's the mentality that we talk about when we read the word keep. If we live by the wisdom of God, this is a great verse, isn't it? Great. Get to have life. It's the wellspring of life. But what's the problem? We don't live by wisdom because we have a heart problem, don't we? And just Proverbs itself, it would reveal this heart problem. Who can say, I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. That's Proverbs 20, verse 9. The answer is nobody. <laughs> Proverbs twenty two fifteen. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. Proverbs 28, 26. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. We heard it this morning uh, in uh, Sunday school that in Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10, that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. It's desperately sick. Who can understand it? The Lord, he searches the heart and he tests the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So again, your culture says to follow your heart. The Bible says your heart is deceitfully wicked. The the world says to trust your feelings. The Bible would say that is terrible advice. Don't do it your way. Don't do you, the American cultural slogan. It'll lead to destruction. And we could share testimony after testimony of that happening Or I told the guys this weekend, don't be like Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. Rather, will you follow the blueprint from the designer? You thought about that? The designer being God, and he's given us a blueprint. He hasn't left us alone. He's come to rescue us. Then, if we do it that way, his way, then you'll have life, and you'll have it to the full. The reason that we have bad behavior is because the source of our our behavior, which is our heart, right? Our heart is bad. Even Matthew uh, says this. Jesus is talking here in Matthew 12. It's a little bit longer. Hang in there with me, but it gets to the heart of things. You got it. I was hoping I'd get a lot more chuckle. Um, 
Matthew 12, 33 through 37. Either make the tree good or the fruit or and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. The good person out of his good treasures brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word that they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Going on in Mark 7, Jesus also says this, What comes out of a person, it defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of a man, comes evil thoughts. So this starts in your heart. If you have evil thoughts, it starts there in your heart. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. You see, your behavior reveals your heart. What what happens if I shake this? What's going to come out? Oh, I'll clean that up later, don't worry. Water came out. Why did water come out of it? Water's in it, not rocket science. Well, this is what happens to us, isn't it? When we get shook and when cares of this world come into play and persecution happens and famine happens and all these things, we get shooken. And what happens? Is things start shaking and comes out. And if coffee was in there, coffee would come out. And Gatorade, so on and so forth, right? So what comes out of our heart reveals and indicates something about us, doesn't it? That we have a heart problem. Nothing, I heard this once, I thought it was fantastic. Nothing comes out of a drunk man that wasn't already there. If a man says something that was in and that came out that wasn't already there, here's an even harder one, maybe for us, if you, if you don't struggle with alcohol, but whatever comes out of a tired man or woman was already there. Oftentimes, I use that, Donna. I'm just tired. I didn't mean that. Oftentimes, it's like, no, that's it's revealing something about our hearts. And the Bible would tell us this, that we need a new heart. Deuteron- going all the way back to Deuteronomy in 5.29, it says, Oh, that they had such a heart, God tells them. I wish they had a new heart to fear me and to keep my commands all the days, that it might go well for them and their descendants forever. God goes on in Deuteronomy 36, 30, verse 6, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart in the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, so that you may live. Ezekiel 36, 26 tells us this, that God is going to give us a new heart for those who are in Christ Jesus and a new spirit he will put in you. And I will remove their heart of stone and I will give them a heart of flesh, a one that beats for me, that lives for me. Jeremiah 31, 33, for this is the covenant that I will make for the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. And I will put my law within them and I'll write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Your heart controls your thoughts, your speech, and your actions. If this verse is true, and it is, what do we think about behavior modification? And how many of us are guilty of that, right? With our own lives, let me just fix this or that. And with our marriages, if he or she would only just act this way. Parenting, uh, yeah, stop doing that. Why? I just don't. <laughs> We're just, it's just behavior modification as opposed to peeling back the layers and figuring out what's going on in their heart to cause them to act in such a way. Why are you throwing yourself down, kicking and screaming? <laughs> There's a heart issue going on. They're not doing it just to do it. It's revealing something about their heart. If this, oh, sorry. Yeah, and then with our own lives, I went back to with our own lives and marriages. So note, who knew? Uh, we want people to, if, if we want people to stop this and obey, yeah, we want people to stop this and, and uh, without getting to the heart of the issue, don't we? It is hard work. Here we say, it is hard work. And I wonder if you can even think of maybe some uh, characters in the Bible where such a thing happened. 
right off the top of your head probably jumps to your mind is the Pharisees. They were great at behavior modification. The rich young ruler, he was pretty excellent at it. The biggest deceiver of all time, Judas, he did it. Jesus wants our whole heart to be transformed from the inside out. The Sermon on the Mount that we looked at this past weekend with the guys, it was getting to this very issue. Things like gossip, it can reveal what? It's not just, not just gossip, that's just the surface level, but what can that reveal? Well, it can reveal jealousy, bitterness, pride of the heart. What about adultery and pornography? That's just the outcome, that's just the behavior. But what's that reveal about your heart? Well, that is lustful and it's not content with the one true God. So we need to be constantly examining our hearts to figure out the motives in our behavior, just as David did. David did this in Psalm 139, 23 and 24. He says this, he says, Search me, O God. Search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way within me and lead me in the way of everlasting. If there's something in there, God, I want to get rid of it. I want to cast it off. So good questions to ask ourselves. I ask myself too. I'm not above any of this. So when I'm asking these questions, we need to ask ourselves, after I acted in a sinful way this afternoon, right after church, on the way home, potentially, hopefully not, but potentially, why did I do that? Or if you're riding on your lawnmower this afternoon, cutting your yard, why did you think those thoughts as your mind's drifting away? What are you desiring above all else? And even more importantly, I think, is the question Jesus gets at is, what are you worshiping? What are you worshiping? Once you have trusted Christ for salvation, you are, a born, you are born again and given new appetites for, his, for God, for his word, for the church. Not perfect yet, is it? But you are being changed from one degree of glory to the other. I asked the questions to this, the gentleman this, this weekend and just said, are your present efforts today, are your present efforts consistent with your future hope? If you're in Christ today, what is your future hope? To be with King Jesus all the days for millennia to come. Wisdom that never runs dry. Is your present efforts consistent with your future hope? Humility is essential in guarding our hearts. So the righteous wise man is marked by humility that recognizes that he needs the wisdom of God to obey God. If you try to conjure up something, we've all been there, right? Let me just conjure up something to obey God, only to find a day later or, or less that you've fallen short, haven't you? But we need God's wisdom in order to obey God. We are to guard our hearts with what? With his word. Guard your hearts with his words. This is the substance with which the wall that I talked about in the city, that's the substance that his word is with which the wall is to be built. To be built around what? Around your heart. Well, how can you build that wall around your heart if you're not in his word? If you're not seeking his word, if you're not seeking his will. Hide yourself in this word. By filling our hearts with God's wisdom and his word and his law, we will produce righteousness in our lives. Not a righteousness of our own, but a righteousness of Christ, right? We begin living out his will, not my will, not your kingdom, or not my kingdom, but your kingdom, right? Your will, not my will, but your will. And so the third part, it's, it's the shorter part, hang in there with me. So this is the last section of this proverb found in Proverbs 4. And that is your behavior reveals the condition of your heart. Your behavior reveals the condition of your heart. Found in verse 24 through 27. Verse 24 says this, Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let me read off just a few more verses. The Bible, I could, I could stand up here for the whole 40 minutes for you this morning and just rattle off all of that Jesus and the even New Testament has to say, but let me just read off a few about what it has to say with the tongue. James 4, 11 says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and the judges and judges the law. James 3, 5 through 6, So also the tongue, it's just a small member, yet it boasts of great things. 
How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members. It's staining the whole body, setting the fire to the entire course of life. It's set on fire by hell. And lastly, Ephesians 4, 29 says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only, only what is good for building others up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. A good question to ask yourself, to ask ourselves is, why did I speak that way? After every event, I, I've gotten in the habit of asking myself, did I encourage those who heard me? Do I need to go back and repent? I, I know I was joking, but uh, did that actually hurt them? Was that beneficial to those who were hearing Jesus says this in Matthew 12, 34, You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We could go on and on and on. Jesus says that our words will justify or condemn us on judgment day. And that's not because of our good works. Why do our mouth and our works justify us on that day? not because of works or good speech. It gets us, that gets us to heaven. That's not what does it. But it's because our speech and our works, they reveal whether or not Jesus has changed our hearts. That's what the Sermon on the Mount's getting to. Has Jesus changed your hearts? Actions will follow. Even the, the age-old saying we heard growing up, didn't we? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Jesus says lies. That's a lie. Words do hurt. I created the world with what? Words. They matter so much. Our words do matter. Look at verse 25 with me. Let your eyes look where? Directly forward, and your gaze be straight before you. You guys know what horse blinkers are, right? They're just the things that go on there that keeps the horse from seeing the side of the other horses and keeps their gaze set forward. They can only see what's in front of them. That's what Jesus, that's what the uh, Father's saying here to the Son in Proverbs 4. If you know Helen Lamel, you may not know her, but you will know her uh, song that she wrote back in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. She said, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of what? His glory and grace. Are you turning your gaze and your affections towards Christ this morning? Jesus says this in Luke 14, 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, his own mother, wife, and children, and brother, and sister, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What Jesus is getting at there, not that you actually hate, but that you put those blinkers on, that your gaze is fixed so upon him that everything pales in comparison. Even your own life, even your own family, it pales in comparison of knowing the one true God. Praise God he tells us to love our wives. Praise God he tells us to be amazing father and husbands because that's what we do to be obedient. But we don't live for them. We live for what? The king, right? King Jesus who came and gave us everything. So where is our gaze throughout the days and the weeks? What stills your gaze, I wonder? What stills your affections this morning? Let's finish up here in verse 26 and 27. Father says to ponder, ponder the path of your feet, then all of your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left or to turn your foot away from evil. Or to turn, turn your foot away from evil. We read this in the Sermon on the Mount this past weekend in Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter the narrow gates, for the gate is wide that, uh, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. If you haven't picked up a, a, a book, or go on Amazon this afternoon if you would. You'll, you'll be extremely blessed uh, by reading Pilgrim's Progress by an old Puritan 
uh, John Bunyan, and he talks about the uh, this, this guy Christian going on this straight and narrow road trying to get there, and there's different distractions that will come into his life, and things like obstinance and worldly wise men and formalists and hypocrisy and all the different things that can come into this world to knock you off. But his gaze is always reminded. He surrounds himself by people to fix his gaze upon the king. It's a beautiful story. Uh, I just I didn't even do it quite justice there, but please pick that up. You'll be blessed. One of the, uh, I think it's the second most sold book ever uh, besides the Bible. But have our footsteps led to righteousness or have they led to sin? The surest way to follow Christ on the path of wisdom is filling our hearts with the word of God, planting it deep, planting it deep. So if you've missed everything else that I've said up to this point, it's okay. Would you tune in just for one last, and just get this one last point. But what we bring in through our eyes And what we bring in through our ears, it affects our heart, which in turn affects our actions. So pray for wisdom and the right decisions to make. Earlier in the process rather than later, right? Where where only behavior modification potentially happens. So in closing, James 4 says this, I think is very fitting to, to entail all that we talked about this morning. He asks this question. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? This is James 4, 1. And you could, you could fill that in with whatever you want. They were, they were fighting and arguing amongst each other, but you can fill that in with any sin. What causes that sin among you? Is it not this? This is it, that your passions are at war within you and that you desire something more than you desire Jesus. Proverbs 4, 20 through 27 is not behavior modification. No, it's, it's that we need a new heart because the, the heart is the command center for life. The heart is the source of every behavior in life. So in order to address sin, in foolishness, we must address them at a heart level. For us to obey God and walk in wisdom, we need a change at that heart level. So this is what happened to Isaiah 6. If you know Isaiah 6, what happens to him is that he walks into the throne room and he gets this vision of he sees God sitting on the throne high and lifted up. And then he sees these terrifying angelic beings, but he doesn't care about them. They each have six wings and with two of them, they cover their face and two of them, they fly and two of them, they're flying. Two of them are covering their feet and each one of those holy angelic beings are crying out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And and then after Isaiah sees this, the, the shaking of the ground happens, the house is filled with smoke and he says, woe is me. Another way to say that in today's language is kill me. I'm undone. I can't stand. Why? Why did that happen to him? What would cause him to utter such things? It's because my eyes, they've seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And he says, I'll do anything. God forgives him. He has an angel come and touches the the coals from tongues and with his lips. And he says, behold, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Praise God. What does he do? He says, I'll do anything. What do you want to do? He says, actually, I want you to go tell these uh, terrible people that destruction's coming. Okay, great. I'll go. Here, my Lord, send me, right? I'll go anywhere that you want me to because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He was willing to do whatever for the Lord because of what he had seen, what he had heard. Have you seen your sin as offensive before a perfect and holy, righteous God who cannot clear the guilty. Every one of us in here this morning are guilty. He can't clear us, but he hasn't left us there. He has not left us there. So we can turn and repent and trust in the one who has paid that penalty for us, who lived the life that you and I could not live, who died the death that you and I deserved, is now seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. Tell the Father, I paid for that. You sin this afternoon, we can go and we can trust in Jesus. He says, I paid for that every time. Will you trust 
and give your life to this King Jesus, even this morning. And he will not only just bless your life, but it says that he takes your sin. I think I got AirPods in here. Yeah, AirPods. This is your sin. We're born with sin, right? God made him, Jesus, this is Jesus, this is us, born sin. God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin, so that in him, if we put our faith and trust in him, we become the righteousness of God. And it's no longer I who live, but he who lives within me. So it's called the great exchange. He gets our sin, he gets our death, he gets our penalty, and we get his righteousness, and we get his life. So walk in it this morning. Why would we not? Why would we go back and trust the world? Walk in that this morning if you're in Christ. And if you've never heard that today, you could still find salvation today and turn and repent and trust in King Jesus this morning. Have you beholden our God in such a way that he's revealed himself in scripture? Do you want the God that he's revealed or do you want your own God? Which your own God is just you <laughs> and our own figment of our own imagination. So guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. Hide your word in his heart, for in his word are riches that run so deep that it will take an eternity. And even then, we still won't even come close to the bottom of that barrel. Will you pray with me? Father, we want, we want you. We need you. We're dependent upon you. God, I know many of you are thinking about, well, but what about that sin? Yes, you covered it. We don't have to wash our hands before we plunge beneath the shower of grace found in Jesus Christ. God calls us that we want life and we want it to the full. We don't want, it, we don't want culture's way. <laughs> they think that they got the best way, but you're the creator, you're the author, you're the sustainer of all things. Would we trust in what you have and trust, even when it's hard, that we would say you know what's best because you're good. You've displayed your character throughout history. God, I pray that we would come, just as even think of Chronicles of Narnia, where they said, ah, the king, he's not safe, but he's good. God, we declare that, I hope in our hearts, that we would trust you and we would declare you're good and that we're not even sure what that next step looks like. And I pray we would find somebody to begin talking to, to learn what it looks like to, to, live, to live fully surrendered, in obeying your truths and your command for your kingdom and your glory and your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.